This interview was recorded on June 16th, 2020. Hi, I'm Len Hepp from LeanPub, and in this episode of the Front Matter podcast, I'll be interviewing Micah Bowers. Based in Seattle, Micah is the founder and CEO of Bluefire, which works with institutions and businesses around the world to deploy mobile applications and cloud services designed to help people read and distribute ebook and other digital publications. In the past, some of the more well-known organizations they work with include household names like Adobe and Microsoft and the New York Public Library. Bluefire is also the company behind the popular Bluefire Reader and, more recently, CloudShelf, an SDK mobile e-reader application and cloud services platform. You can follow him on Twitter at Micah SB and check out the company website at bluefirereader.com. In this interview, we're going to talk about Micah's background, his career, Blue Fire and its evolution over the years, uh, and ebooks and the ebook industry more generally. So thank you very much, Micah, for taking the time to be on the Front Matter podcast. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I always like to start these interviews by asking people for their origin story. Um, so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about where you grew up and how you first became interested in technology and uh, producing digital things. Hmm, okay. Uh, well, for me, it started in college. Uh, I was going to a Evergreen State College down in Olympia, Washington. And I decided that what I wanted to do was um, uh, interactive multimedia. And this is the late 80s. And so at that time, that was literally uh, uh, HyperCard um, was kind of the what that represented at the time. And um, so I studied uh, a variety of digital media uh, technologies like, you know, audio and video and and all that kind of stuff. Uh, But then when I got out of school, there really wasn't a market yet for employees in the digital interactive media space much. Uh, It wasn't really happening yet. And so uh, I ended up working in the film industry. So worked on a TV show called Northern Exposure for a few years. I uh, did a lot of different television commercials, rock videos, that kind of thing. Um, that was in the early 90s. And then from there, I got into Digital Post. Um, and then I finally got my opportunity to start doing uh, interactive media with um, a, a CD-ROM project that was uh, pretty fun. It was, a, it was called Piper, and it was a musical um, for kids uh, starring Jason David Frank. Is that his name? He's the, he's the mighty Morphin power ranger, the black, uh, suited ranger. And, uh, in any case, that was a lot of fun. And after that uh, project was done, which was about a nine month project, uh, three of us that were on that project went and started, um, a company, uh, called, um, Livewire. And, Livewire got a big break because the very first week that we were in business, we got tapped by Microsoft to make a their install disk for MSN, uh, and they wanted to do a multimedia extravaganza, uh, and so we and they said, well, we need it fast because the company that we hired out of LA to do it, we don't like what they're doing, and but we got to ship on this date, and we came back and said, okay, well, we'll need five hundred thousand dollars, thinking they were going to say no. And they said, okay, go. <laughs> we went, oh, okay. And so that, uh, that really launched uh, Livewire, uh, and that went well. And we um, eventually uh, sold, merged with some other digital agencies in this space, and then eventually sold that to uh, a company that acquired us. And then I left there and started Bluefire. And that was uh, Bluefire I founded in... 2000. So and, it was a, a weird time. Yeah. Before we talk about Bluefire, I want to talk a little bit about your interesting background. So what, what was the time when you, when you were doing the work for Microsoft for the big launch? Uh, oh, you mean at Livewire that when yeah. we started that? Yeah. Gosh, that must've been 1996 or 97. It's, yeah, it's, it's really interesting, actually. Just re- like you, you unearthed an old memory I had of I was in Delhi for the launch of Windows 95. We're, we're both very much dating ourselves. <laughs> yes. Uh, but I remember the sort of big, like the people might not know this, but like, like, I mean, nowadays it's kind of like the, the big kind of uh, Steve Jobs esque kind of person on a stage, you know, trotting out other people on the stage to give presentations. But there were, there was a different kind of launch for products like that in the past. Um, you know, there might be like a video with like the stars of friends, famously for how to how to use windows or something like that sure but, but i remember um with the launch of windows 95 i was in this fancy hotel in delhi for whatever reason uh and um 
they could play a video by the band Weezer on the computer. And that was just like an incredible thing, like that you could watch a video like that, like a rock video on the computer, at least yeah. like, for me. And like, you know, it was like, this was sort of like, wow, on the, like, you know, we're all used to watching rock videos, but now we can do it on the computer too. And what does this mean for the future? So what kind of work, if you, if you can recall from the past, what kind of work did you do for this multimedia launch? Because those were, those were really big deals. Oh, sure. Well, that was, uh, it was, it was distributed on CD-ROM. We shot it in film. Uh, we shot much of it at the Paramount Theater in Seattle. Uh, we had, it was basically promoting their six different channels. And so we had six different individuals. Um, well, actually one was a couple. So there were seven people. There were the stars, there were actors, and each one represented a channel that, and those channels were demographically focused. And so they each had, so they had these characters essentially. And, uh, each of those, uh, um, both had a, were all on the stage at one time, um, but each one was this separate little video and they would alternate which one would play because you couldn't play full screen video back then. And so to make it seem like that kind of, the other ones would just kind of have be sprites that would kind of move around a little bit while one was speaking and that one would be video all composited to remove the background so that you would have minimal noise, that kind of thing. So that was the kind of thing that, that we did at the time. And it was, and actually there was a, a young actress who was, I think maybe 17 years old at the time, a blonde. And she went on late. She went on to have quite a career. That was one of the first part things she ever did. And she, and I don't remember her name because I'm terrible with actor names, but I know that she was married to, the guy that's the star of Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh yes, I know exactly who you're talking about. I have I have just terrible name recall yeah, as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll 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 everyone listening will probably actually know, and it'll be like we're a couple we're of old done. guys and going like, you know, that guy from the thing in the place. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, no, that's really that's really interesting. And so and so you you um you went on to found Blue Fire, and what was the I mean, just if you could talk a little bit more about what the inspiration was for that and, and going out on your own. Yeah, well, so later on, in, well, it's to lead into that kind of, it, towards the end of the time at Livewire, we were doing a lot of work in what you would call, let's say, interactive TV of the time. And most of that was not actual shipping product. Most of that was prototypes. And so we were doing a lot of work with Sony U.S. Research Laboratory uh, down in San Jose <clears throat> doing... Um, essentially examples of what a interactive television experience could be like. So the, the whole idea was this 10 foot interface, meaning you're using a remote control and was using the Sony uh, uh, 3d capabilities of their chipset and, and, and compositing uh, and to do some really interesting things. And so we did, you know, news shows and sports shows and uh, sporting events and uh, other kinds of different TV programming to represent the, the possibilities of interactive TV, which they would then show at NAB uh, and those other kinds of big uh, broadcasting technology events in Vegas. Uh, and so I often go down to, to Vegas and, and do these, these private demos for studio executives and so on. Um, and that was a whole heck of a lot of fun. Uh, and so when I, when I, when we sold, Livewire and I and I went off to to start Blue Fire was essentially doing the same thing. Uh, I actually had at the time in my mind that I was going to actually create my own content, um, so I was going to do a mix of for hire uh, digital media uh, and and um, and some of my own uh, content. And I was re I was looking to do uh, kind of outdoor action sports stuff in, or from the Northwest and. Um, and, and at the time, you still couldn't really do full screen video uh, very well on CD-ROM or the internet. And so I was looking at using um, uh, Blu-ray as, as an interactive TV format, essentially, to make highly interactive titles. Uh, never ended up actually doing that because I just got too busy with other things. So we, we had some clients that ended up coming back. To, to work with Blue Fire that I worked before, like Sony US Research Labs and like Microsoft Studios and so on. And I just got, just kept real busy and so never did, never did get around to making my own content. Um, and, uh, 
And we did those kinds of projects for uh, the first several years. And we started doing a bunch of kind of prototype development work for Adobe. And so we did, for example, a really interesting project was um, a, a prototype of Photoshop on a phone, but it was a feature phone. So it had the rocker button, the four-way rockers and, and that kind of thing. So trying to envision what would Photoshop be like on a feature phone. Uh, and that was a lot of fun. And so after a couple of different projects with Adobe and ended up working a lot with the photo and the Photoshop team, the Lightroom team, and doing a bunch of, um, we actually became kind of the flash experts uh, at Adobe as kind of consultants in terms of creating flash content. Um, and then we got tapped actually to, uh, to look at a potential flash competitor, competitor technology. And that would be, but it would be based on web standards. That project um, then was, didn't happen because Adobe acquired Macromedia and thus acquired Flash. And so some of the people that were involved with that, with that went on to take the similar concept and apply it to eBooks. And so we got involved in eBooks and the very first prototype we made was an eBook reader for the PlayStation Portable. Wow. The little gaming device. And that was a lot of fun. And that was part of a pitch to Sony to work with Adobe in terms of using their um, ebook technologies in Sony's ebook platform. And it worked. They, they, they decided to do it. And thus the beginnings of reader mobile SDK and the Adobe DRM platform and all that uh, kind of came to be which also had another component to it, which was that previously public libraries had been able to lend content, um, but it was PDF and it was, um, so it was ebook, so to speak, but it was PDF and it was read in Acrobat, but there, it never really took off. And so they decided to take that out of Acrobat. Well, by the time, but then all of a sudden Kindle came along and there was massive new interest in it, but it, but it was too late in the cycle for Acrobat to, to put that back in to their plan and their ship date. So we needed to create a separate application uh, to, to handle eBooks and thus Adobe Digital Editions and the Adobe platform was kind of born out of that as well. It's actually, this is something I was really looking forward to talking to you about. I didn't, I didn't know that you'd worked on Adobe digital editions. I did. Um, uh, and you've got a, you've got a really great talk, which I'll link to in the, in the transcription for this interview, uh, where you talk a little bit about how, you know, all, all projects have their origins and, and some of them are more complex and uh, fraught than others. Adobe digital editions is the one product that we advise authors not to use. Sure, uh, and I can tell you the very specific reason for it is that they test their ebooks on it, and then things get rendered improperly, and they assume that means they're going to be rendered improperly everywhere. Sure, uh, but this like there's some deep like corporate story and technology story behind Adobe Digital Editions, and I was wondering if you wouldn't mind taking a couple of minutes just to just to talk about that because it's this it's this thing that like I think a lot of a lot of authors and, and actually like publishers I've worked with in the past, like their first experience with trying to create an ebook was with Adobe digital editions. Um, sure. Well, it, it really does come down to the fact that a, well, one thing you have to keep in mind is that when we originally designed Adobe digital editions and the UI design and the functionality design, it was intended to be built in flash in the browser. But okay. that would have required uh, a, um, a set of technologies in terms of being able to f related to DRM that couldn't be just done in the browser at the time. And so it would have had to do something that was more like what later became Adobe Air, which if you'll remember was kind of a desktop implementation of Flash in a way, an extension of it to the desktop, but that didn't exist at the time. And so... Kind of the last minute, we had to uh, get it into its own desktop application shell. And so that was part of some of the oddness of 
of the application. From a technology standpoint with the rendering engine, a big part of it was that it, when we created it, and this was what, 2005 maybe, um, it, it needed to um, be able to run on these e-ink devices. And these e-ink devices, um, I mean, meaning the rendering engine, the whole technology stack, and these, and these, and they had, I mean, they have terrible processors now, but they had really weak processors back then and very weak graphics capabilities. So to create um, a, a stack that would work in it, it had to be extremely efficient and extremely targeted to those chipsets. The PDF engine is called Tetraphilia, which was actually left over from a PDF render that was done for the like PDA devices, if you remember those. So that was a very efficient, uh, low power use, low uh, chip, you know, library. And of course you're going to use that because you're not going to write it from scratch. If you got that right. Then for EPUB, you couldn't, I mean, the right way, of course, to do EPUB would be to use a browser because it's HTML, right? I mean, a browser engine. But you, there were no browser engines that could run uh, efficiently enough and do pagination, for example, especially, which is very processor intensive on those devices. And so it was, you, Adobe team had to literally write it their own custom browser specifically targeting that specific device. And this was at a time when the EPUB 2 standard was not even ratified yet. And so it was right around the time that it was ratified that it was released. But when we first started on it, there, was, it, there wasn't even, the spec wasn't even done. We didn't always know what was even going to be in it. So that's really kind of the origin story of how it came to be odd in that way. Yeah, thanks very much for sharing that. That's just so fascinating. Um, uh, one of the one of the you know sort of pleasures of this podcast is we get to talk to people who've had lots of experience with different things. One of our most recent episodes that we published um, included a guy named uh, Larry Garfield who did like Palm OS reviews of devices back in like the you know early days of of, of the PDAs mm-hmm. and things like that. Um, and uh, actually, like I, I really mean it, like getting to hear the story of how this this came about is really fascinating because the the yoking together of all of different technologies and different standards and different, I don't know, protocols, I suppose, around, around DRM, for example, seems to be something that you've spent much of your, much of your time trying to deal with. And you've, you've colorfully described the sort of ebook industry as Kafka-esque, um, which Indeed. works, which works on a number of levels. We've just learned about one of them. Um, but another of them is, um, the unwillingness of sort of conventional publisher publishing companies to embrace eBooks in the past and even in the present now. And so it's really fascinating to me that the companies you were working with were like Sony uh, and, and Adobe and things like that. And it's just an interesting thing that like from a very, from the view from 30,000 feet that it wasn't like penguin. No. And it wasn't until much later that I even worked with publishers at all. And what experience I did have with publishers was not particularly good. Um, and um, they are uh, publishing, publishing companies are not big fans of spending money on software. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's challenging. Um, and, um, but there are some really great individuals that work within the standards groups and so on who are just, amazing individuals, especially the people on the EPUB working group. And now that are part of W3C who are some of the most dedicated, thoughtful, hardworking, well-intentioned people I've ever met. Yeah. I'd like to talk to you about standards in a little bit. This is just a fascinating, a fascinating story in itself in the Redium foundation and, and, and things like that. But, um, yeah. how did, so, but you, you, so you were in TV, you were in rock videos, you were in all kinds of other kinds of production work and you ended up building this blue, the blue fire e-reader. Uh, yes. How did, did that come about after the Adobe digital editions work that you did? So, about maybe, let's say, I think we released Adobe Digital Editions in, 
and and the and the Sony released their stuff in 2006, and then we worked with the Barnes and Noble to get Nook out the door, right? In like 2007, something like that, and then by 2009, um, we were saying, you know, we should we should make an app for this new crazy thing called the iPhone. And iPad didn't exist yet. And we, we were like, yeah, this is perfect for reading. Um, and um, however, right around that time, so, so we were going to work with Adobe to do that, actually, make a version of Adobe Digital Editions for that. But right about that time, uh, Bill McCoy, who had been the champion at Adobe of this whole platform and the person who single-handedly made it all happen, who, who, by the way, has become a very close friend of mine, lives on uh, Vashon Island or Bainbridge. Bain, Bainbridge, yeah, Bainbridge. A um, uh, fantastic guy. But anyways, the, uh, he, but he, he left and he landed at the, after many, many years at Adobe, and he had boobranged, I think, a couple times before from Adobe and done startups and so on. But now he left and he went to be the executive director of the IDPF, which is the standards body for EPUB really to go and really try to push through the EPUB three standard because for him and for myself as well, our, our passion for ebooks. So a big part of that was the ability to make rich media, interactive ebooks, not just, Reflowable books, right? But in any case, um, so he left to go do that. And then at that point, without that champion there, it kind of floundered. Uh, there, were, there was no real uh, – it, it, the business unit had been part of kind of a new initiatives business unit uh, at, at Adobe. And um, that business unit was actually – as is very common in these big tech companies. They tend to come and go. Um, and they, they, they try, they try different things. They're like, well, let's try this new business initiative thing. No, let's, let's, no, let's keep everything in the, in the, in the core business units and let them do their innovative stuff. And so it was the end of that kind of NBI phase of Adobe. And so then at that point, the business units, it didn't, there wasn't really a business unit that really made sense for it. Meaning the Acrobat team was like, eh, what's this ebook thing? Really? You know, it's not part of their mission around corporate documents and that kind of thing. Right. And anyways, so it, 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 it became clear that the, there was not an in, in, in inertia to make a, a, a iPhone app at that time. And so we decided that um, at blue fire, we said, well, you know, the in- industry really needs this. And if we don't do this, then it's just going to be, you know, and, and by the way, I'm not, anti Amazon, but I, I do believe that it's important to have some diversity of competition within markets. And I have always been worried that Amazon would over dominate the publishing industry. Um, uh, and the, well, the retail industry and publishing industry, um, for books. And so I, I felt that it was important that, that a mobile version, that a mobile option exists that was outside of these big, big box, giant tech company, you know, worlds because they're, they're, they're the walled gardens. And the whole point of the Adobe technology was to make it so that anyone could use it. Anyone could build their own app. Anyone could use their own logins. Uh, there was no, I mean, yeah, the DRM was, and the DRM was designed to be interoperable. So you could buy from one place or another place and they would all work in all the apps. And so it was quite a vision for a kind of independent and thriving kind of third way from this kind of, corporate closed uh, world. Right. And, um, and so I, th- I thought it was really important. And so did my business partner, his name is Patrick. He's our CTO. And so we decided that we would do it. And we, in fact, had to literally go borrow money from our families to pay our bills uh, during this time where there was about a, uh, maybe a nine month, it took us nine months to develop the iOS version. And uh, we had, we did some other work during that time, but we were really trying to stay focused and get it done. Uh, And so that's how it came to be. And it was designed to be uh, an app that was going to be an endpoint for uh, retailers of all kinds to be able to use it as the app that they 
uh, deliver content to, and we were going to do, uh, we were actually going to have like a mall, so to speak, inside the app. And in fact, we built that and we using a, a, uh, a format called OPDS for expressing catalog data. Um, and it's um, kind of a flavor of like RSS Atom kind of stuff. And we actually invested a lot of money in creating a system to index all these various um, OPDS feeds so the user could actually go in and type in a book and see all the places that it's available for sale or to, to loan and see the prices or, or so on and then choose which one they want to they take. And they can choose a specific store if they want and just shop that or they can shop across all stores, et cetera. And so we actually built it and worked and we submitted it to Apple. Uh, Apple initially accepted it, but then within a few weeks, actually, they changed their policy and said, nope, you cannot have links in an app that point to a place where you could buy digital content. And so that blew up our entire business model. We got a call from Apple, some guy named Dave, wouldn't give us his last name, insisted to be taken off speakerphone, telling us that we were going to get our app pulled from the app store if we didn't immediately take that out. And, and famously, story-wise, we said, well, this is a really important app because it's the only way currently to read ebooks from public libraries on your platform. It's the only way because at that point, Overdrive didn't have uh, a mobile app. And, and they said, oh, yeah, your app is about as useful as a fart app. The guy from Apple literally said that to us. And we were just, and this is after we spent a year and all our life savings and money from our parents to make this app. And to hear them say that to us was just terrible. It was terrible. Yeah, that's, so, that's awful. Yeah. And, and, and so and it's, it's funny that it's all wrapped up in all this sort of affect of um, seriousness with like, turn it off speakerphone and I won't tell you my last name. And then there's just some like snide insult. Yeah. You know, like what, what a mess. Oh, it was, it was like, it was like getting stabbed in the heart. It was terrible. And um, so anyways, uh, after uh, a bit of uh, weeks of, of pain and conflict and trying different things and so on, we eventually decided that we'd have to abandon that business model. And that's when we decided to go to making apps for each of our customers in their own brand and integrating their retail or library platform into their own app. And we, in, and since then, and that was probably 2000. 10, I guess it would have been early when we started down that path. Um, we, uh, I th we've done, I think, 70 different brands of, of apps all over the world um, for e-reader apps. However, Blue Fire Reader was already in the app store. So we said, ah, well, we'll just leave it there. Essentially, it's a calling card. So like a marketing piece to show our capabilities because it was getting used by people. And it was kind of neutral, right? If you were a too small of an organization to have your own app, um, because it costs money to do that and to maintain it, um, people would just say, yeah, go use Blue Fire Reader. And so, uh, and we weren't making any money off that, but we were getting some Google, you know, some search engine links and so forth. We're like, eh, all right, well, this is a, yeah, we're kind of, you know, this is kind of odd that we're creating this product for, for free for users and that other, these other companies are using, but yeah, it's, it's probably, it's good enough because it's a marketing piece for us. And so we did it for years and years. Uh, and in, 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 and over that time accrued about, I don't know, right now we probably have somewhere around 4.2 million active installs of blue fire reader. Um, so yeah, that's how that came to be. Thank you very much for sharing that story. What a, what a lot of ups and downs. Um, uh, yeah. It's, um, do you think, I mean, this is just total, you know, kind of pub table opinion, but like you've had some inside experience. Do you think Apple's going to be able to keep their kind of tax that they get, you know, like 30% off every sale in the app store and you can't sell things in your app? 
I, I certainly think that they're, they want to, um, if, if they, the only thing that would prevent them, I believe from doing that would be if that somehow got regulated. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting. I don't know if you saw today, there was a, uh, kind of a high profile issue where, uh, the founders of um, 37 signals that do like base camp and oh, so yeah. forth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, they've made a new email platform called Hey, H E Y. And um, they had submitted their app to Apple and they accept, accepted it. Actually, it was very kind of like almost like <laughs> PTSD triggering to read it today. Um, Cause I was reading this literally this morning uh, that, they had an Apple accepted their one Oh, but then they went to do a, a, a minor bug fix update and apparently Apple rejected it and, and was basically insisting that they, they do in app purchase in their apps because they were allowing users to, to sign up for a subscription outside the app and then consume their cons- subscription inside the app. Right. Um, but they weren't offering it in, they weren't offering a way to sign up for the subscription inside the app. And, um, and so he's mad and I, I can relate <laughs> very, very, very intimately can relate to that. Um, so anyway, it's very interesting. So yeah, it's still going on. And he was, he was, uh, he was kind of going off today about that. And, and it, so it was interesting to see that it, it's, uh, 10 years later. Is that is that DHH that you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, that's DHH. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's fascinating. I, I hadn't checked the news today. Yet. Yeah. So um, uh, I hadn't seen that, but yeah, that's that's fascinating. And it's, I mean, there's a higher level issue of like having your service tied into someone else's platform. Um, yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, and if there's just there's just exposure to that, but you know, it's 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 interesting. You know, like the it's the same way a lot of newspapers actually feel about Google, right? Um, or, or even, or even stores and things or like, oh, or how people companies. feel about Facebook or how people feel yeah. about all kinds of, yeah. 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 And, and in, in particular in our, in our world, that's sort of the world of self-published authors are often, you know, like, like Amazon's their platform. Sure. Amazon, Amazon through certain services might force exclusivity on them. Oh yeah. And then, and then, you you do everything you can to position your book properly and then something in the algorithm changes and all of a sudden like a, a, a sort of a really interesting example is getting your family to buy your book the day you published it is a really bad idea or at least was for a time because it would scramble the algorithm because it wasn't just people who bought you know werewolf novels all of a sudden it was people who you just the people in your family who buy all kinds of other things are all of a sudden buying this werewolf novel. And it's like, what, what the heck is this thing? I don't know how to promote it to anybody anymore. Um, and, you know, a lot of us find ourselves in this situation uh, that, you know, that's, I mean, there, there were analog versions of it, of course, in the past, but where like, you know, these decisions are being made in an opaque and unpredictable way uh, that have a huge effect on, on everything that you do. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wanted to, uh, go on to talk a little bit about cloud shelf and, uh, the cloud shelf SDK and things like that. And, and maybe a little bit about DRM, um, sure. just generally, because it's such a huge thing and it has, I mean, I, I sort of, I, I breezily fire off a, an anti DRM blog post once a year. Uh, but like, I don't have corporate clients that can get sued you sure. know, for things getting misused so i but i but before we do that i would like to take it like what has become a sort of uh standard digression uh in the midst of these podcasts to talk a little bit about um uh the coronavirus and how it's been affecting you and and your company um uh it's been affecting everyone we work with uh in various ways obviously because it's been affecting everybody uh but uh you're the first person from seattle that we've had on the podcast in a long time um, so I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about uh, what the experience has been like there. Well, there's a lot of different facets to that. But if we talk about just the, just the company for a moment, um, you know, we're a small team. Um, we are seven people. Of those, it had gotten, we have 
lot of people that work remote and we've had, you know, some people that used to be here, work local, but then have moved somewhere else for various reasons. Or their spouse needs to move for a job or whatever. And we keep, we keep people. We're very interested in long-term employment of our team. And so most of our team have been with us for 10 years or more. Um, and we try to treat them so good that they never want to leave. Um, and they don't usually the, um, but in any case, the, 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 there, so there's four of us that would regularly work in our office in Ballard now. Um, and since the, uh, virus hit, we decided that, um, I decided that I wasn't going to work there anymore. And, uh, for the time being, um, and, um, Patrick, who's my business partner works there every day because, and he also lives like four blocks away. So it's really handy for him, really close. And so that makes a lot of sense. And, um, and our, our other, we have an, um, uh, we have an office manager, Jessica, that comes in maybe once a week, uh, to the office and then is mostly working at home, but sometimes she really needs to come in because all the filing cabinets there are there and that kind of thing. And so that's how we've been handling that from a, and then that's working fine because we're so used to people working remote on our team all the time. It's really almost unnoticeable other than me not seeing Patrick in person every day uh, and doing our customary. We, we usually do a, uh, like a one hour walk meeting every day as our kind of check in miss those a lot looking forward to doing that again but in any case uh so from that standpoint not that big of a deal from a business standpoint it has not been much of an impact in a negative way and in fact all the impacts on the business side of things have been positive because we have a revenue stream through our DRM uh, uh, technologies that we sell and and um, which which have transactional based revenues and those transactional based revenues have doubled during the during the pandemic or more. Um, lending, especially academic lending, has increased dramatically. Um, and so our, our revenues are up there and as well as our sales. So we were, start, you know, like a few months ago, we started selling blue fire reader. We started charging for it in the app store, which we thought was insane. We're like, let's just do an experiment. See, does it, will anyone buy this? Well, they do. And that surprised us. And, and there's a whole thing to talk about there in terms of paid apps and the upsides that we've seen from that, that we had no, that we did not, not anticipate at all. Uh, but like it's going way up in the rankings, but in any case, um, the, uh, the revenue from that went up as well because more people were getting eBooks and more people were getting blue fire reader. So from a business standpoint, it's, it's just really been a, a positive. I mean, I, I mean, I obviously would be rather that didn't happen, <laughs> uh, but, um, but you know, at least you gotta take what you can, right? When the good, the good with the bad. Yeah, well, being I, I think uh, sort of you know it's a well known thing that you know I mean we're we're doing this interview on Zoom. Uh, yes, Zoom's usage has has shot up dramatically. Um, uh, anything anything that's digital and that allows people to do the things they love to do without having to be physically in touch with each other, uh, those are things that people have turned to in this yep. time. Um, you know, we've it's it, I wouldn't say use the word dramatic, but like we've seen, we've seen an uptick in, 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 in not only in sales, but in book creation, which is really interesting. People are taking the time to create more books yeah. than they were in the past. Um, uh, at least, at least from our, you know, kind of like, you know, tiny portion of the pool. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah. And so what, uh, I, I just wanted to ask a little bit about like what, how, how things were in Seattle. So for example, here in Victoria, where I live, um, there haven't really been all that many cases, really. People reacted relatively, uh, this is all anecdotal, people actually started reacting pretty quickly. B British Columbia, the province that Victoria is in, is on the west coast of Canada and was one of the first places to be affected by the novel coronavirus. Um, and yeah, people kind of like started, you know, you know, a lot of the news is like, oh, the economy was shut down by the government. And it was like, well, here, like everybody started acting on their own. 
uh, oh, long yeah. before any directives came down from the government. And it was, you know, I would say the most, the most kind of obviously kind of like, you know, eth ethically minded businesses were like, you know, the, I remember like a couple of restaurants were just like, we're closed, you know, long before the government said anything. But at the same time, um, partly because of that, and this is to the, to the ire of my co-founder, Peter, but masks never really took off here. Mm. Uh, I, I basically see none in my neighborhood. Really? Uh, yeah. No, wow. people just don't wear masks. And, um, and recently, and it, they never really did. Uh, I, I mean, I, I would, if I was going into a store, but I also learned how to shop online for more things than I did in the yeah. past, and stuff like that. But so, and what's, what's, and so, and now like the pubs are open and it's just like a back and all, you know, like it's, pretty wild and like i'd knock on wood crossed fingers i hope everything works out okay but um you know it's that's that's been my experience just watching things happen here what's it been like in in seattle mm. for you yeah well so we we were probably if not the earliest hit region at least pretty much contemporaneously to to other where New York, let's say, where it was also hit. And the, and because of that, it spread fairly quickly before anyone really even knew it was here. Um, and so, and then by the time we started figuring out that it was here and that there were, there was beginning to be a bunch of cases, it wasn't yet clear what the scope was because you couldn't get testing and you couldn't get tested. And, um, but there was the anecdotal stories uh, of the hospital hospitals in, increasing and so on, and then well, new stories as well. And so, I think once people began to recognize that it was it was real and was happening, then yeah, it was it was long before the the government stepped in. People just started staying home. And, and the restaurants were empty. Everything was empty and everyone was staying home. And then also our, our government was one of the first to move. So our, our you know, uh, Governor Inslee and the uh, mayor of Seattle and so on were very, very early in the move to, 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 to make that step. So we, we were hit fairly hard um, in terms of numbers, of, but it was, it was able to be turned around. Um, and there was, you know, mixed bag of masks, but of course everybody was just in, in their home anyways. Um, and of course the CDC's advice, uh, that you shouldn't wear masks because, and well, they were saying they didn't work, but they were mostly lying because they were just, um, they didn't have any, uh, didn't, they didn't, they didn't want the medical professionals not to have it, which most people in Seattle, which high, Seattle being, you know, Seattle has the highest per capita education of anywhere in the United States. Um, so a lot of the people in Seattle knew that what was going on. And however, so the people weren't wearing masks because actually it was considered um, poor form to wear a mask because not because it didn't work, but because it meant that the professionals might not have them and that you would might be inspire other people to hoard masks or buy masks or whatever. And so it was very much, it was, it was not really a thing where people were like, oh, that's stupid, it's wrong. And it, it, was, it was really a, a moral uh, and ethical uh, consideration. And then finally, once it became like, okay, the government's like, yeah, okay, now you should probably wear masks, then everybody did. Mm -hmm. And so now if you go out, like, so for example, we, my family went to the recent um, uh, march, it was called the Silent March a couple of days ago, uh, for Black Lives Matter, and uh, there were sixty thousand people there, and I would say ninety nine point five percent of the people were wearing masks. I mean, there's times when you'd look around, and you couldn't see anyone. I mean, you'd see a huge crowd, and you couldn't see anyone that wasn't wearing a mask. And then every once in a while, you'd see you'd see one here or there, uh, but it's that level. Yeah, that's really fascinating, and that's a whole. Uh, you just opened up a whole another path that we could we could potentially go down. But um, I would yeah. just say to anyone who's interested in Micah's views on on politics, just follow him on Twitter, <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, I do. Uh, you'll, um, you'll, you'll find out very quickly what he thinks. Um, yes, uh, can't. I'm progressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I think that's probably how kind of how we found each other on Twitter, one way or another, eventually. But um, yeah. So, um, 
Uh, I mean, but you've, you've already given us a little bit of like, you know, a very lot of, you know, interesting story there of like tens of thousands of people meeting in, even in the midst of a, a, an awareness of the danger uh, because there's other dangers that matter too. Yes. Uh, and that, you know, it's, and Mo, oh, and by the way, I, I, I didn't mention to you when we were chatting before we started this, I now record a little ominous. This interview was recorded on such and such a date little thing before every interview because uh-huh. things change so quickly and that, you know, it might be a couple of weeks before this comes out. And by that time, you know, things will have changed, but you know, every, every one of these inter- interviews has become a little snapshot in time of uh of things you know happening rapidly and um you know hopefully eventually going in a very good direction um so thank you very much for taking uh, for for being willing to talk about that i really appreciate oh, that sure. I, kind of, I kind of hit you with it out of the blue but it, it it is something that that we we have been talking about on every episode um so going back to the, the main thread so we've mentioned the, the the acronym drm a number of times in this in this interview, we haven't talked about what it, what it is, digital rights management. Um, uh, so this is a really, this is a really curious thing. Um, the idea is basically that people want to have digital products wrapped up in security protocols so that only the person who purchased them or the person who has uh, been lent to uh, can access them. And this creates all kinds of crazy headaches uh, technology wise. Um, uh, for example, you know, if your loan period expires, do you have to, is it built into the technology that it can auto renew or something like that? Or do you have to go loan it again? I guess I just really want to, I don't know how to ask it more precisely than this. Like, what's your view of DRM? Is it, is it something that we would be, would have been better off without, or is it some, is that a meaningless question because of litigation and copyright? Yeah, well, I, so I think, I, I, I think DRM has its place and I think it's also sometimes misused. And so in the case of lending, you kind of have to have a mechanism for expiration or else you're just giving away books. Right. And, the, and, 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 it, and, and, that's fine if people are happy with you giving away their books, but if they're not happy with it, then it's not okay, right? And so that's needed. So right there, the technology has to exist, and and um, and there needs to be a way to support that. And because those technologies need to exist, there is this benefit of it existing in a, a kind of a commercial way as well, because the commercial um, revenues actually kind of fund it, fund the development and maintenance of it. But but also, in the case of commercial retail, you're selling a book, you know, it relates to both the value of the book, it relates to the popularity of the book, et cetera, et cetera. So you certainly could have a very reasonable system where you said, yeah, um, blockbuster hits, which is where the publishers make the vast majority of their money, just like in films, where they, if, they, if, they're, if they're, those are the things that are most likely to be shared um, uh, illicitly if they can be uh, because they're popular and people want, Oh, like you want to read this too? Of course, here, here you go. Um, and um, so you have that kind of social network component of, 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 of sharing, so to speak. Um, and then you also have the very expensive content and very specialized content. And um, that also has its own consideration. So in those, if, in, a, in a scenario where you need, you know, you you could totally have a, a, a retail platform that's that was it was up to the um, the content owner as to whether they want to DRM it or not. And actually, many of the retail platforms have had that option for a while. Um, so it's really a, a choice. Although I will say that the um, the problems with DRM are largely that you're talking about are largely a legacy uh, problem. And what I mean is this, um, there was a time when you would download files and you would move them around and you would put them from one platform to another platform and you would back them up and all this kind of stuff. Well, in the modern world where you have this kind of, I used to say like, yeah, Amazon might be a walled garden, but if you took down the walls, the vast majority of those people would never want to leave it anyways. Um, and, um, because of the benefits of it, it's like Apple, 
people choose Apple specifically because it's a walled garden in a lot of cases. I mean, they may not think of it that way, but ultimately that, that's, that is true. And so the, the considerations, and, oh, and of course, we're always connected to the internet now pretty much. And you can always re-download your stuff on multiple devices. And so you don't really need to move files around in that, the way that they, they were. Now, for small indie distributors, it's still a little bit of a challenge because we have never had, I've tried multiple times, and that's been a big part of my foray into ebooks, try to solve the problems that it presents for smaller indies. Like, like what I was trying to do with Blue Fire Reader with its mall-like uh, uh, interfaces with, with doing a white labeled version of an app, try to push the cost down so that each small retailer could do their thing. We at one time built an app for indie bound, uh, if you're from, which was a platform of the American publishers association, I believe it is. Um, that was actually working with Google when Google was, was, was providing retail infrastructure and we were providing, um, ebook, uh, the ebook reading apps and, uh, and so it, it, we tried multiple things to try to make that work. Um, and still to this day, there isn't really great solutions for independent small retail. And so that is a pain point still to this day because of the costs, right? Uh, um, because, and, and it's not, it, I mean, the reality is, is that if you, it, it's, but it's not, but the reality is that the vast majority of the time, people, if you want to, provide a uh, a retail platform that is going to compete at all with Amazon, even if it's in a tiny niche, right? You really have to provide a, a, a level of a bar of user experience and functionality, right? You need an app, right? And you, because you need a way for someone to just come to their app, sign in, there's all their stuff. And they get on a new device, they should sign in and there's their stuff. Um, there's no business model that we that, that that makes sense for someone to do that for you. You have to do it yourself, and so and that's and a lot of publishers and retailers and so forth will try to try to try to get around that. And so, for example, Adobe Digital Editions really kind of like Blue Fire Reader is not a great user experience in a lot of ways for people because that's not really it's not really intended to be. Adobe, why would Adobe care about those consumers? They're not paying Adobe anything. They're not their Adobe's customers. Why would I care about the Blue Fire Reader users? They're not my customers. They're not paying me anything, nor are the retailers. So you could have a model where you're saying, well, okay, retailers, you need to pay me something so that you can fulfill books into our app. And we've considered that before. Um, and we've explored that. And we actually, um, part of that kind of integrated experience in the app um, that we had that I described, we took a percentage of the sales and that was our business model, but it was much smaller. It was actually 7%, not 30, um, but which just seems a lot more reasonable to me. However, it still felt high to them, but once we could no longer sell content in the app, meaning they would have to just like, let's say, come and sign in. Now they get access to their files instead of having to download them. What's a in little indie retailer going to pay for that? And it's not going to be, it's not going to be cost effective. So the problem is, is not the technologies in, in terms of the awkwardness that you see, because it can be done perfectly seamlessly without, with not that much money. It just isn't, it's just used wrong a lot. Right. Right. And I think, I think this might be a good, good opportunity to um, uh, move on to talking about cloud shelf and the cloud shelf SDK and the Redium foundation. Um, because yeah. I mean, you've done so much work. I mean, you, you know, starting from a point where like you have to actually understand how the chips work and, you know, how to get an e-ink, you know, sort of like HTML page to render kind of thing right. to trying to give people solutions so that any kind of, any kind of, well-trained developer can actually deploy a kind of ebook uh, solution, I guess we'll call it. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the Cloud Shelf uh, SDK is and and about the Redium Foundation and what its goals are. Yeah. So we'll, let's start with Redium because it's kind of built on that. <clears throat> so after the EPUB3 spec was ratified, Adobe was not at that time interested in investing in their platform and doing the 
substantial amount of work it would take to add EPUB3 support to their SDK. And it was important to me um, and to my colleagues that we have that. And we worked hard on the spec and we worked hard on getting to this point. So we, but we were just too small of a company to be able to actually build that all ourselves because it's a really huge undertaking to build an, a, a renderings or ebook solution for, for browser and the four major platforms, you know, iOS, Android, Windows, Mac. There's just no way in hell we could have done it ourselves unless we took like millions of dollars in investment. And so, I mean, millions and millions. Um, and so we said, well, the only way we're going to be able to pull this off is if we can team up with other companies and work together to do it. And so we'd said, okay, we're going to have to, and the only way that's going to work is if it's open source. I mean, there could we could have tried to do a partnership of some sort, you know, proprietary, but we're like, no, it's got to be the only thing that's going to really make sense is open source. So that was the foundation of, we decided that we needed to make this open source project. And so we found a few companies that were willing to work with us. One, by the way, was Kobo. Um, I was one of the founding members. There was another one out of Canada called Evident Point ourselves. And, um, and uh, was there another one? I think that was the th- that was the original three. Um, and so, um, anyways, and that was I don't know seven years ago now or something. Um, and so we started down the path of trying to create this rendering engine for EPUB three that we could all use. Well, we succeeded, and that's that's has now occurred. Oh, it took years of work to do, um, and still not really done on all platforms, I would say like Mac is still almost there on Mac and and Windows. It's, it's, I mean, I, I would say it's there at a base level, but it's not that like sweet. Right. Um, But anyways, we did get to that point years ago on Mac, on iOS and and Android. Uh, And so, um, but the thing that we found uh, one of the challenges is that our focus there was, let's work together to use technologies that we can all use. It wasn't necessarily, Hey, let's make this trivially easy for anyone to just make their own e-reader app. That wasn't the goal. Right. And especially since some of us make money making e-reader apps. Right. So that really wasn't our goal. Um, We wanted to make something we could use or, and not keep it to ourselves. Anyone could join the foundation. And for a while we were like, well, you either have to contribute a certain amount of code or contribute a certain amount of money so that we can hire people to contribute code. Right. Um, and, uh, and that's changed over the years. Now there isn't a paid option. It's just, it's just free to anyone. Um, once we got, basically once we got it done, right. Then we're like, well, let's make this free. Um, but, um, the, uh, but the, it is very, it was difficult to work with very complex technologies. And so cloud shelf SDK is a, uh, a, a commercial product that we sell incorporates re- reader, a Redium SDK, but makes it really easy for someone to build their own app with. So you could literally build an e-reading application full featured in like a day. Um, And so, I mean, that might be a little, I mean, that's probably, well, you could get it up and running in a day. I mean, you're probably not going to have it ready to ship in a day. (laughs) You know what I mean? But you'd be reading eBooks. And of course there's a part of that, project or an adjacent project to Redium uh, is the what's called LCP. And that's a DRM platform that's also open source, or at least 90% open source, because in order for it to be less hackable, there's a little component of it that's that you have to kind of register for and, and get and promise that you won't divulge the secrets or whatever, right? A certificate. Um, but uh, the vast majority of the code is open source. But Redium SDK can be integrated with any DRM system. And in fact, Adobe did. In fact, Adobe took Redium SDK that we created and they put it back into Adobe Digital Editions oh, and wow. into our Reader Mobile SDK and hooked it up with their DRM. Wow, that's an, that's an amazing story. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, where do you see, what do you see happening next with, uh, with Redium and with Cloud Shelf? Well, so what's been interesting is that we have not had a huge success with getting adoption of, of those things. I mean, some, 
but not a huge because basically by the time we kind of were done, the industry was in a massive slump, meaning it was our customers were dropping like flies. So, you know, like I said, we had 70 customers at one time that brands that had apps. I think we've got 10 now uh, that, that are still standing, so to speak, because they got acquired, they got out of eBooks or they went to, or they gave up and they went to Kobo, they went to Kobo and just said, okay, we'll just, we'll partner with Kobo. We'll sell Kobo devices and they'll give us a share. And that's, we're done. Right. That kind of thing. And so, um, so there was just, there was just not new entrance into the space. Um, and once people had entered and invested and had a DRM platform, it's very difficult to switch. And so really that's been a challenge. So it's it, it, in Europe, we're seeing, uh, some advance, some movement forward, uh, especially like the French publishers are very supportive of it because they really don't want the, to be completely dominated by American corporations, their whole industry, because their publishing industry is, and their is a, a key part of their culture and their culture is exceedingly important to front the French as it is to a lot of people, but the French, you know, particularly. Um, so, uh, so there's, I, th- I think we're, we're seeing most of the success we're having as a medium projects and so on in general is happening in uh, France, but there's some things like Quebec similar. They're kind of, then it kind of goes there. And there's also some action going on in, in the Nordic countries where they, they oftentimes don't have Amazon there for, or not strongly for a variety of reasons like Norway, Norway, they don't sell Norwegian eBooks. Yeah, it's you're touching on something so fascinating, which uh, we get to see a little bit of in our in our business as well, which is the way different countries and even regions within countries relate to books and ebooks. Uh, yes, it varies, um, uh, and uh, it's a it's a really interesting. I lived in I lived in Quebec for a few years in Montreal, um, so I'm a little bit and had a little bit to do with the culture scene there. So I'm you know a little bit familiar with how that how that scene is. And yeah, and it's, uh, it's, it's a curious thing. Um, you know, there's different countries, for example, like Germany, uh, everybody was accustomed to being, being able to sort of like call up the local bookshop and get a book delivered within a day uh, for the last few decades kind of thing, or at least as that's my understanding. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it, Amazon plays this weird role because they're like, Hey, we can, you can just order a book. And they're like, but I could, I could do that already. Um, anyway, I, I won't yeah. but yeah, there's, there's all these sort of really interesting regional, regional variations around the world. Um, I guess, I guess my, uh, and which, which obviously you've, you've had a lot of experience with as well. Um, yeah. I guess, I guess my, uh, my last question for you is what's, what's next for blue fire and for you. Yeah. So we are, uh, getting re re energized about blue fire reader. So we had kind of gotten sick of it and we were thinking about just, just putting it down out of its misery, so to speak, because we felt like the industry wasn't going anywhere. And, um, and these mobile platforms are so hard to maintain because they're changing so quickly all the time, breaking things left and right, adding new requirements, et cetera, et cetera. So, one of the reasons we put blue fire on sale in the app store is because we were like, well, if we're going to kill it, let's just do the experiment we always wanted to do and charge for it. But the fact that it's getting some, um, the people are paying for it. I mean, not huge, not big money, but enough to like, "Hmm, hmm." people will actually pay for stuff uh, in the app store. And so they kind of got us excited, but, and then Ebooks kind of resurged under the pandemic. And I think some of that's going to be sustained. And so we kind of got re- more excited about it again and um, re-energized. So we're, for example, and, and part of it is in order to move forward with the apps, we needed to completely rebuild them from scratch because they're 10 year old technology. The newer versions of reader mobile SDK from Adobe weren't compatible with the things that we had done. Uh, Cause we, we had modified the, Armist to decay heavily because we could and we knew how and um, which we can't do anymore because of the way the model is doesn't, they don't, they don't provide source code. 
Um, and so in any case, uh, so it, it meant we had to completely rewrite the app. So we're right now right in the process of completely rewriting Blue Fire Reader. We've got several new business model uh, things going on, uh, plans, some of which will be script subscription-based services and some of which will be retail, some of which will be retail of stuff that we are part of publishing, um, which is all new uh, for us. And so that's an exciting thing that's happening. Um, we have to do a similar, we already had, we were forced to do something similar on Android in the sense of having to rebuild from scratch, but it was because of basically Google eventually said, Hey, you've got things in, you've got code in here. That's, that's Google provided components, but we've deprecated because of various reasons and you can no longer distribute it. So we're going to take your app out of the app store unless you uh, update. And the only way we could update was be to completely start over from scratch essentially. So we did that too. That's already been out there. Although that's kind of like we just did the emergency version of that and got it out the door and I'm not at all happy with it. Um, and so we have to revisit that as well this year. So a lot of this year is going to be revisiting Blue Fire Reader, completely redeveloping the iOS version. We've done a lot of work on accessibility recently. So for the very first time, um, when Blue, the next version of Blue Fire Reader comes out, we'll actually have a uh, text-to-speech uh, TTS and full voiceover support. Uh, on Apple and TalkBack on Google, Android, which will be the first time that the Adobe platform has had that on mobile, uh, which is going to be a big deal, I think, uh, especially since so many uh, libraries across the world use that platform, especially academic libraries, higher education. And so um, so that's pretty cool. I'm excited about the accessibility stuff that we're doing. Um, and then also we're doing a little, little bit of stuff outside of the, um, actually the book area altogether. And then kind of when we were thinking like, oh, we're done with ebooks, let's just, this is just, you know, let's have a one year transition and get out of here. Um, we uh, started taking on a few other projects that were not related. Um, the most interesting one is a, a medical device. Uh, where the medical the device is, is a home medical device and it's the app is essentially a combination of like a remote control and a health tracker kind of com combined on um, speaks over Bluetooth, uh, low energy with this device. And we've been involved with the hardware from day one in terms of the design and, and, and of the architecture of the firmware and the interface of the app and that kind of thing. So that's been really interesting and fun. And um, I don't know yet whether we're going to continue to take on other initiatives in the kind of hardware space, but it's pretty fun. Um, and that's really what drives me, right? I've, I've never been in this in business for getting rich. I do it because I, I, well, one, I, I, I don't take orders very well. <laughs> <laughs> and so I got, so I really don't have much of a choice other than to have my own company and, and B I want to do stuff that's interesting and fun and, and meaningful to me. And so that has been, and eBooks have been that. Uh, and, and it's nice that that's kind of resurgent. And I don't know yet whether I have that with medical hardware. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing all that. Best of luck with all of those, with, with all of the things that you're going to be up to uh, and uh, the, maybe the new directions. Um, it's funny just to, and you, you reminded me, I interviewed someone recently called Alex Hillman, um, who uh, is based in Philadelphia. And uh, he called himself, I think it was something like inherently unemployable or something like that. Yes. And we, we really bonded over that because like, if you want, if you want, if you want me out the door, give me a command, you know? Um, and it's just, uh, some of us are just like that. And that's why we find ourselves in the various, on the various paths we end up on. Indeed. Uh, Although I can have, I'm okay with boards. <laughs> if it's a good board. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Micah, for taking the time to talk to us and to cover so much ground and for being game for all my shifting from one thing to another very rapidly. And not all, sometimes I'm good at segues, but not always so much, but, uh, you, you uh, responded very well right away to everything I asked. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to do this. Well, thanks. It's been fun. Thanks. And as always, thanks to all of you for listening to this episode of the Front Matter Podcast. If you like what you heard, please rate and review it wherever you found it. And if you'd like to be a LeanPub author, please check out our website at leanpub.com. Thanks.